Hello everyone, welcome to the Concord University Athletic Alumni at Work interview series. For the 14th episode, we travel a short distance to the confluence of the New and Greenbrier Rivers and the Bluestone Lake in Hinton, West Virginia to check in with 2016 Concord University men's cross country and track and field graduate and current Summers County High School cross country and track and field coach. Please allow me to introduce Stephen Starlipper. Starlipper. How yes, are sir. you, my man? It's a great honor to be here. Thank you, Wes. I appreciate you. How are you, man? Uh, pretty good. Hanging in there uh, during our, you know, pandemic circumstances and uh, just living life to the fullest. Good, good. I'm not sure if you noticed there, but I, but I want a little baseball, a PA announcer on you with the last name uh, twice. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember all the times at Concord and the Concord games and the Princeton Rays and we used to talk about you know, how the Pirates announced and stuff, and I like that. <laughs> All right, man. Well, speaking of baseball, you got big shoes to fill here on this latest edition of the interview series. We had Andrew Wright on last time. He's with the New York Yankees now in the Dominican Republic. You can head over to our YouTube channel to watch his interview and all of our interviews from uh, the Athletic Alumni at Work series, or just if you want to check out any kind of highlight videos, we have those over at YouTube, Concord Athletics 1, but enough for that plug. Steven did some pretty big things here at Concord. Two-time All-Mountain East Conference first-team performer in cross-country and was on Concord's 2015 MEC Men's Cross-Country Championship team. So, my man, I, I've, I've, I think I've done a, a decent job of introducing you here. So, give us a life update, if you could, on what's been going on with you for... Uh, you know, I guess about four years since you graduated here. Well, uh, it was a rough beginning when I graduated. Uh, I went back home. Um, and I'm from Hancock, Maryland, a very, very small town. Uh, not a lot of opportunities in that area. Um, and, I, you know, I, I was a, I'm a teacher. I, well, I went to Concord and got an undergraduate degree to become a physical education and health teacher. Uh, so I got into the substituting uh, business to start, and I tried to get, you know, on by that. And it's just tough to get in up there. And I had some issues because it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so over time, uh, you know, I got frustrated as anyone would trying to find a job just getting out of college. So I went kind of back to the drawing board and I was like, how could I, you know, get an opportunity to become what I want to become? So I thought, what, what better than, you know, to come back down, you know, to the Concord area and see, you know, what I can do. And uh, there was a guy named you know, Mike Miller and he was my advisor at concord and i, I kind of i called him and you know come up with some ideas and he was from summers county west virginia which is a neighboring county of mercer county where concord is and uh you know he we talked about it we seen there was a job open and i went to the interview process and uh you know he was a big part of that so you know they could be comfortable with me and stuff and eventually i got on at summers county uh, public schools and I now am the physical education teacher at Hinton Area Elementary. And then I coach cross country and track and field at Summers County High School. Uh, so, you know, I always thank Mike, uh, Mike Miller for, you know, all he's done for me and getting me into this position that I'm in now. And I enjoy coming back down to the Concord area and giving back to this community because they gave so much to me during my time there. You know, we're going to jump into... Uh, a, a lot of that here coming up, but uh, also a, a plug for Dr. Mike Miller next door to my office here at Concord. Him and Dr. Westman here. I know that you are you had a lot of classes with those guys. But but Steve, before I go any further, actually just just hit me as you were talking there. Uh, obviously, you're trying to teach in the middle of a pandemic, and for you know teachers that teach you know core classes, math, English, science, social studies. Uh, stuff like that it's, it's it's easier but what what are some of the challenges for you trying to teach PE virtually well um, we've gotten lucky down here that we you know as a school well of course at the beginning it wasn't like this but when we come into the 2020 uh, 2021 school year um, our school board of course I think it was the whole state they came together and found a way to be able to get our students back in school which is most important, but also keeping them, you know, safe. Mm -hmm. And I thought they did a pretty good job. So we have like half the students, you know, that, you know, they, the ones that want to, they attend school in person. And we always have the ones that's virtual. 
Uh, the challenges of that, I look at it this way. Uh, you know, I always say the standard is the standard. And, you know, no matter the circumstance or situation. So everybody's kind of in the same boat. Everybody kind of has the same challenges that's faced in front of them. For physical education, uh, you basically, you know, if, if you can get the students out the door, either walking their dog uh, on a playground or just walking through a, you know, a grocery store to help their mom and dad out, that's, that's all you can ask for because they're moving, they're getting their steps in. And the challenge is, um, you know, you just have to you have to be cautious with everything. Uh, keep wiping down equipment whenever we're working with the students in the school, and uh, just trying to keep us distanced apart. Um, it's all uh, even in a normal year we have challenges. Uh, this just added to it, and you just kind of kind of have to stay positive with it and keep rolling with it. We're going to swing back around to some of your stuff in the scholastic area of education there and Summers County, but I do want to jump into your running career, and I'm sure like a lot of people, Steve, that growing up, running was, you know, a, a secondary sport, you know, it wasn't something you focused on until maybe high school or even a little bit later than that, so what other sports were you involved in, you know, during your, you know, elementary years and in, in, in onto your early teenage years? Well, uh, mainly I was a baseball player. Uh, I loved baseball. I grew up around the sport. Uh, a lot of my family members played baseball, and I just kind of grew into loving it. Uh, I grew up watching, you know, TBS Atlanta Braves, WG and Chicago Cubs, and I always wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. So I did, you know, T-ball all the way up to Colt League and high school. And I did those sports, and kind of like um, how, you, how you phrased it there, you know, it was kind of like a, running was always a secondary sport. I pitched for a while, and pitchers have to run a lot because on their off days for stamina. Um, and what I did was, you know, I, I just kept I just kept doing that and built my legs up to be a better pitcher or outfielder or wherever I was playing. And then, you know, the track and field coaches come over, and they're like, why don't you kind of come out here and run for us like a secondary sport? And that's kind of how I got started with running. Uh, but mainly it was just baseball. I tried basketball. Uh, I mean, I like basketball and stuff. I like watching it, but it never really stood out to me to be, you know, a, a player in it. Um, mm -hmm. I always helped keep the book and stats and stuff kind of like you know, the jobs you perform up at Concord, um, whether it's keeping the book or stats or whatnot. So baseball was my first love, and it still is today. Um, but running always holds a special place in my heart just because it got to me. It got me a lot to where I am today. Was there someone that maybe – you know, pushed you to be like, hey, your your future's probably over here with running. Was there someone in particular that kind of told you that? Absolutely. Uh, the guy by the name of Jeff Spielman, and uh, it upsets me today because, you know, I, I just, he was my idol, and I lost him this summer uh, just uh, unexpectedly. Um, I, I used to talk to him every every couple weeks, and he was still like a, men, a big mentor to me today. And, um, he, he's the one who kind of pulled me aside and he actually called me one summer and he's like, I'm going to start a cross country team, Steve. He goes, why don't you come out and, and run for me? And he was my elementary physical education teacher. So he was already a big part of my life leading up to that point. And I, as I sat there with my mom and heard that on the phone, I was like, there, th that, there's no way that I can pass up this, this opportunity to come out and run for this man. I mean, he's, he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. And it was a rough beginning to start because I never ran that long a distance before. And it's a big adjustment period, just jogging three miles on your off days from baseball as compared to running three miles hard to try to beat people. And he was just a big influence in my life, and he, he's really the one who changed it and got, got me into you know, running competitively and getting better at it as I went and seeing that hey I was capable of a lot more than what I ever thought I could do before you come to Concord and we're going to unpack this a little bit you end up at Hagerstown Community College not too far from from where you grew up there in, in Hancock what what other college interests did you have I, I know you probably told me this before and I, and I don't want to mess up the story so if you could w what other interests did you have coming out of high school and then what was the ultimate uh, kind of link to Hagerstown well I didn't have any interest coming out of high school uh, Hancock Middle Senior High School where I graduated from um, is the smallest public school in the state of Maryland and on my cross country team we didn't have I had one teammate and that was a, a young lady uh, was one year below me and I didn't have any teammates so 
in terms of standing out as a team, we didn't have that opportunity. So I was an individual runner. I uh, took a bus. It was me and Coach Fieldman and his son, who was assistant coach, and the young lady that ran with me. Her name was Anna. And we'd go to the meets. And, I mean, nobody really took us serious because, I mean, first-year program, this was in the second year of the program. We, I was there for two years. My junior years when, when I started with it. And uh, just a small program, uh, Hagerstown Community College, JUCO uh, Conference. Uh, they're small. Uh, they're looking for, you know, bodies to fill their positions because lots of athletes don't want to go the JUCO route. They want to go D1, D2, or D3 because a lot of that's because you can't graduate from a JUCO college. Uh, well, and a lot of different things. Some, you can have two-year programs. Mm-hmm. But if you want a four-year degree, you've got to move up to someplace like Concord. And, um, you know, just the interest level was rough. So I went down there as a walk-on, and I had to really get, you know, improve my, my times. I was not even looked upon at the D3 level, let alone a D2 level. And then when that was all over, uh, Hagerstown Community College, uh, there was some turmoil going on in the area, in the program. And a guy by the name of Mike Spindler, a legendary coach, he's the JFK 50-mile race director. He, you know, took me under his wing. I trained under him. I got even better under him. And then yet still, I never really got recognized. And then uh, a guy by the name of, you know, Mike Cox, uh, he, you know, I got in touch with him through another guy um, up there, and it's it, it, it really went on from there. And I went down, me and my mom and dad went down to Concord to visit Coach Cox in the community, and we just fell in love with it. And I just thank Coach for giving me that opportunity and everybody that ever did because I never would have dreamed when I started my senior year of high school that I'd ever be a D2 athlete, let alone a junior college athlete. I knew you was going to bring up the name Mike Spindler. I hadn't prepared anything to ask you about Coach Spindler, but I knew it was going to come up in conversation. So you say that you're a walk-on going to Hagerstown. What did Mike Spindler do to get you to where you were before you walk out the door to come to Concord? Well, when the turmoil was starting to go on with the coaches I had at HCC, Hagerstown Community College, um, I was – I was in my second year. I couldn't run no more than two years at JUCO, Mm -hmm. and I was kind of stuck. And I I didn't really have the times right away that stood out yet for a college coach like Mike Cox to even look at me or even know who I was because of being so far away from Concord. And Mike Spindler, uh, the biggest factor that he gave to me was just keeping me motivated and just, you know, overall confidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that guy, you can ask anybody in, in, in the Washington County, Maryland area, even the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia that knows him. He's standard-driven, goal-driven, and he's been there and done that. And he will give it your all if you're going to give it your all for him. And, he, I mean, he only coaches motivated, high-aspiring athletes. And I took that to heart. And today I still use a lot of his – his motivational tactics to use to my own kids down here at Summers County or wherever I may end up. And just, just, just that. And he knows a lot of people. So I knew that with him being knowledgeable and him being a well-known name that he would know a guy like a Mike Cox or a Howard Nipper or somebody like that. And it just turns out that he absolutely knew who they were and it all worked out at the end. All right. And we're starting to get some good names going here. We got, we got Howard Nipper in the picture. Mike Spindler, Mike Cox. I want you to hang on to Mike Spindler because I actually want to circle back around to him, and I want you to go into more detail about what your, you know, some of the theories that you're using from him that you use um, at, at Summers County there. So hang on to that, okay. Steve. Information is is extremely tough to find on a lot of junior college websites. It's nothing against Hagerstown. So I don't want. I want you to do it justice. Tell people how good you were at Hagerstown Community College. Well, when I, I walked on uh, in 2011, and I, I never got a training plan uh, from the coach. I just, I guess it was just a lack of a communication. Uh, he was a he, coach for all, He's a great guy. I guess it was just a lack of communication there. And I got down there, and I had, I didn't even know what it was to run over the summer. Coach Spielman at Hancock just introduced me to the sport. Sure. And he got me involved, got me into it. I had no really knowledge that you had to run lots of miles and build-ups and long runs to, to, to get to 
you know, to where you want to be successful. So when I got down there, it was a huge learning curve to me. And I, I didn't really fit well to start. And I, being from Hancock, small town community, I, I just didn't fit well with kids that was in big schools leading into that. So it, it was a big build. And then on top of that, after my first season across country, Coach Ferrari and Coach Jamie and Coach Tony, uh, they all retired and, and moved on. And then I got a new coach that come in. And uh, he was a great, I mean, he, he was a great coach for me. He taught me a lot as well, as well as Coach Ferrari. But my time still weren't there because I was still adjusting. And, it, and you know, as well as I know, uh, Wes, with the running, it, it takes years to, to peak. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it just doesn't happen overnight. You can't just sit around and show up and say, I'm going to run and come out there and blast off a four-minute mile. It just don't work that way. So you got to work for everything you get. And um, after about a year under Coach Snyder, who was the replacement to Coach Ferrari, um, I started to get better. And then there was some turmoil situations going on at the school. And then I was done and my time was over. And then that's when Coach Spindler come in and took me under his wing. And like I said, I can't thank any of those people enough for just showing me a little bit, just a little bit about what they knew about the sport. All right. So you spend your time there at Hagerstown Community College. You come into Concord as a mid-year transfer, spring of 2014. What was the common denominator with Coach Cox and Coach Spindler? Like, how, like how, did that, how did that communication get started, I guess, is the question. Well, I'll back up a little bit before I get into that one. Okay. Um, as, I, as I started to, to, to excel under Coach Snyder, uh, we ended up making two national championships in cross country. I, I got to go perform at the national championship level. Which was in, in Hobbs, New Mexico, in 2011, and then in 2012 in Ren Lake, Illinois, for cross country, and that's when confidence started to build a little bit. And then in indoor track in 2013 March, I qualified for the indoor track national championships at Texas Tech University, and again confidence was just soaring through the roof. But then right after that, uh, that's when the turmoil stuff started. And I, I was, I was just, my confidence got derailed and I didn't have a coach. And that's when Mike Spindler jumped in and I took weeks off from running because just psychologically to get myself right. And I, I got, and I, I just lacked a lot of confidence. And then coach Spindler kept, you know, messaging me and stuff. And it was every night and that, that's what it takes. And then eventually he got me back to where I needed to be. And he got me to a point where I got to represent a U.S. team at the Canadian Trail Championships to run for the United States Cup in London, Ontario. And, um, and, and with Coach Spindler's squad, with three other um, athletes I got to run with, and, and on our team, it was a relay race. And we got to go up there and run against Olympians and stuff like that. And it was shortly after that, it was November, which is right around the signing period. And I got introduced there to Mike Cox, and the day that I told Mike Spindler that I wanted to go down, I, I was going to go down and meet with Coach Cox at Concord, they were on the phone that night talking for hours. Hang on, hang on, they hang on, hang time. on, hang on. Time go out. Ahead. How did you meet Coach Cox? Okay, well, um, another, again, turmoil at Hagerstown Community College. The coach that I had, Coach Snyder, uh, he had to resign. And then a new coach came in called named Jeff Campbell, who used to be the coach at West Liberty. I was never under this guy, uh, Coach Campbell, because my time was up. But I was training under Mike Spindler, and I was in the HCC Arc indoor track complex doing a workout. And he stopped me, and he said, why don't you come run for me? And I explained to Coach Campbell, the new coach at HCC, that I couldn't. My two years was up. And he said, why don't you go down and run for Mike Cox? I met him in the Weebiac when I coached for West Liberty, and okay. I think you're a fit there. Okay. So I told Mike Spindler about it, and the next thing, and, and the, like, the next day, they're on, he, they're on the phone for hours talking oh. to each other because Mike Cox and Howard Nippert, who, like you said, we'll get into him later, they come up and ran the JFK 50 mile ultra marathon race that Mike Spindler's the director for. Okay. And I remember watching Mike Cox run that race 
as as a young just a, a young middle school student in 2007 when Howard Nippert won wow. and Mike Cox was the rabbit for him and so they talked on the phone for hours and the next thing I know I'm in my I'm in a vehicle with my mom and dad coming to Concord where a place I never even heard of and then I step out there and, and Coach Cox is just he's like a father figure to me right away in the snap of a finger he's just a nice guy and really took me under his wing so that's kind of it's a strange way of it's just everybody has their own way of getting to where they need to be and mine's just just a, it was just a crazy situation where I had a coach and it was turmoil and he resigned the new coach came in I was never even a part of him I was doing a workout for Mike Spindler and he was Mike Mike couldn't be there that day and this guy named coach Jeff Campbell just pops up and he, he goes why don't you come run for me and just and then and then I told him I couldn't and he's like well why don't you come down here I'm going to introduce you to this guy named Mike Cox and that's just how it all came about just a weird situation wow I, yeah, it's I, crazy I, I didn't know the half of that to be I, I'm, I'm blessed for it I just I couldn't believe how it all just panned out like that and that's the only opportunity I had I mean it was either Mike Cox or go up to Slippery Rock Pennsylvania which the coach up there I mean I didn't really know him very well but he just he didn't seem like he really wanted to give me an opportunity Right. So I just thought, you know, that was the only two places was Slippery Rock or Concord. Yeah, and yeah, and and, and honestly, you couldn't have gone wrong because John Papp at Slippery Rock is yeah has won a myriad a myriad of PSAC Absolutely. championships in both track and cross country. So you really couldn't go wrong there. So now that we got that out of the way, and that was a that that was a lot. But uh, Steve, I'm really glad that you illustrated that extremely well. So, it's tough for me to explain that sometimes, just because it's so much going on. It's hard for the viewer to probably follow all that. Sure. But you are a mid-year transfer there in, in 2013, going into the spring of 2014, like I mentioned a, a couple of moments ago. What were the challenges of being a mid-year transfer at a four-year institution? Well, first and foremost, uh, I'd never lived away from home. And I, I, my community college I went to was 45 minutes from my house, and I commuted every day. So when I first got down there, I was really emotional. I mean, I missed my mom and dad. I missed, you know, Hancock, small community. And I didn't know anybody. And it's just, it's tough to, it, it's not easy to meet new people. And for me, coming from a town like Hancock, it's definitely even even harder. Mm-hmm. So to, to, to transition into that, it was hard. Uh, I I credit guys like Brad Dugan and, and Brandon Lee for being great teammates and taking me under their wing and showing me the works that how, you know, the way Concord, you know, how it works down there, small town community, just like Hancock, um, you know, showing me graveyard loop, Concord campus loops, uh, pipe stem state park, and j- just, just being great, you know, great teammates, role models, whatever you want to call it for me. And the, just that was one challenge. You know, the second challenge is just learning how to live on my own, uh, being in you know Woodell Halls, just a small area, just adjustment period, and just, just that just common things right there was just the main issue that I had. You know, moving down. You go back to what you said there. Uh, I don't know, ten minutes ago or so now. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about how you have to build up as a runner. And you get to Concord and you begin the steady climb. You have a pretty solid track season that culminates with a seventh seventh place finish in the 5,000 meters at the Mountain East Conference Championship. So with that race, did you find yourself that you finally had kind of settled into training at Concord, but at the same time, were you kind of hungry for more at that point? Uh, I was hungry for more, but um, I, I also have to stop and remember that I hadn't ran a competitive college race since March of 2013 at Texas Tech University at Nationals. Mm-hmm. I, I ran that Canadian Trail Championship cross country race, or a type race, uh, up in London, Ontario in October of 2013. But I hadn't ran under collegiate athletes. Trail running is completely different than running against college athletes. And when I got to Concord, uh, the first race was at Marietta College. And I, I'm not going to say I felt winded, but I felt weird. And a lot of that was probably be because I was under a new system with Coach Cox, learning the adjustments. But when I got to that, you know, that, that first Mountain East Conference uh, title race in, in track, 
Um, I did settle in more. I, I definitely left that race more hungry because I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm a guy that's never satisfied. I always think there's room for improvement no matter what I did. It don't matter if I was, was to win the race or finish second. I always think there's room for improvement. And I was in the middle of an adjustment period, and I was trying to get my feet wet again and get back into the competitive nature because it's a little different running a trail just up in the trails and stuff against post-collegiate athletes as compared to actually coming and running against, you know, the beasts of college, so to speak, and D1, D2 level, even D3. Just as a point of reference here, just so I'm clear, how long was your, uh, your trail race in Canada? Well, it was a relay race. Uh, okay. Team Canada and Team U.S. had four runners on each team, um, and we each ran 12.5 kilometers. And I, a 10K is six miles, so I'm not real good at math, but 12.5K, I would say, is probably about 7.5 miles, yeah. roughly. Yeah, seven, yeah, and in that ballpark. Trails. And um, you know, it, it was uh, each person ran the big loop. And then we, would, we, we, we wore a, like a... I don't think it was like a chain. It was like some kind of a wrap thing around your ankle and you took it off and you had to put it on the other athlete, your teammates, whenever you, it's like a relay instead of a baton. Gotcha. You, we, we used like an ankle bracelet or of some sort. And, um, it, it was, it was a tough race and I learned a lot. I mean, I got to run against a guy named Taylor Mill from Canada who was on the 2008 Beijing Canadian team, ran the 1500 and the steeplechase. A lot of people know him around here as a High Point University graduate. It was a standout. All right, so let's let's shift into cross country now. Summer of 14, you, you kind of know what to expect from Coach Cox. You guys have kind of built this rapport now after being together for a track season. Some of the highlights of that season, you finished ninth at Greensboro, second at Pipe Stem, and the alumni meet, uh, a little deal out at Camp Creek. You finish... Fourth, you're having really good results as an individual, but the team maybe isn't, you know, I, I don't want to say Concord's falling off, but at the same time, it's not what Concord is used to from a team standpoint. So what's going through your mind, uh, you know, initially in that 2014 cross-country season? Hey, I'm telling you, I mean, it was a rough one. Um, we were going through a little bit of a culture change, and um, I, that summer I got Coach Cox's his first solid cross country workouts and I got introduced to double double runs, AM PM runs and like two hour long runs. And these are things I really was never used to either, even under like the coach Spindler's uh, training, just because I, I don't think we really wanted to go that high up. Uh, but when I got to, when, that summer, I had, you know, I, I kind of got introduced to that. My body was going through like a huge transformation, just learning that. And I, I would I would train with some old JUCO teammates I had from Hagerstown throughout that summer. And uh, when I got down to Concord, I got to go to camp, Camp Atari. Uh, I got to learn a lot about, you know, the mountains, regions down here and running up the mountains and just a little bit about breathing techniques and a te- little bit of uh, tactical stuff that cross country brings that I really didn't know a whole lot about it in, in junior college. Um, and then, you know, you know, I had to, I had the teammates there and we had an up and down year with injuries. I always used to get a lot of injured early in the season, but they'd make sure I was healthy by the time they needed me to get healthy. And then when we got to that conference championship race in Pipestem, and it was in November because it was a, um, I think it was a festival year. Correct. And we we ran that race, and uh, I, that was the best I ever felt. And I ended up getting second. Uh, I know I was closing in on uh, I think it was Nathan Whitaker from West Virginia Wesleyan for the win, but I just ran out of time. And I was just, I was learning a little bit about how, how to run down here. Like it's, it's a different breed in West Virginia as compared to say Maryland with the mountains and stuff. The courses are so different. The weather's even different. And it's just, just a big adjustment period altogether that year heading, or heading into it and out of it. You teased it a little bit uh, with that second place finish. Uh, but heading into that conference championship, Steve, Concord hasn't hadn't really run against West Virginia Wesleyan or Wheeling Jesuit or really any of the other conference schools, maybe outside of one or two meets against the University of Charleston. And I want to ask you this question, and then I want to follow it up with another one. You mentioned Nathan Whitaker ran for West Virginia Wesleyan, 2014 individual champion. He went to Hampshire High School. Did you have any prior knowledge of him? 
Uh, I did not. Okay. Uh, when I was at Hancock, uh, again, small community, small team. It was only me and that one young lady that, I, that was on the team. We kind of stayed local. We didn't really go to a lot of meets. Okay. Um, I don't think I ever ran against a West Virginia team besides Berkeley Springs uh, prior to coming to uh, Concord. Right, because Hancock. heard of it. Right, because Romney, West Virginia is not that far from Hancock, right? Yes, it's about an hour, uh, give or take 55 minutes to an hour. That's... I've been there and stuff. I know a lot about Romney. Um, right. We used to play West Virginia um, School for the Deaf in football okay. at Hancock because we're a small town team and we we're looking for teams that we could be competitive with. Mm-hmm. And Maryland School for the Deaf in Frederick and West Virginia School for the Deaf in Romney were just two examples of teams that we could play in basketball or what whatever sport we could play them in and be able to have an opportunity as opposed to playing a big city school in Washington County where we wouldn't be competitive at all. Sure. So so I mentioned the lack of information you have on other teams. You're Like you said, mm-hmm. you're learning the courses here in West Virginia. You'd run at Pipestem as, as a home meet, the, the conference championship as at Pipestem in 2014. So what's your game plan individually going into that meet where you wind up being second, being all MEC first team? Well, my game plan actually starts in August. And I, it's, I mean, I, I have a little bit of different tactics from others. Um, most likely everybody's different with it. Um, I was always big on keeping my body healthy. And I knew certain workouts and certain races that I would have to, I'm not going to say, not give it all out, not go all out, but save a little bit for when it means the most. And it's all about, as this is in a lot of sports, being getting hot at the right moment. And if you're hot at the right moment, great things are going to occur if you if if you uh, you know put it in the right area. If, Let me if, ask you this, the, Steve. Go. Let me ask you this. How do you how do you get hot in cross country at the right time? What's the secret there? Well. I'll tell you how it happened at Pipes then. That alumni meet is about festival year. It was about three and a half to four weeks before that conference championship meet. Sure. I definitely could have ran a lot harder at that meet, but I knew I didn't have to because I knew we were winning the meet. I had a great teammate in front of me. I knew we were going to win the meet. I had great teammates behind me, wherever I may be, and I knew it didn't take my best effort on that given day to win so i do what it takes to win that day and i tend to focus on the challenges that's right in front of me like today Mm -hmm. i don't worry about ones that's down the road and i knew that that day i could save my body a little bit still get a solid workout in and not lose anything and still win the meat for our and help win win the meat for our team so when to get hot in cross country you you can't get stale our sport is so easy to get stale on, uh, whether it's middle of July in the heat of summer, uh, having a two a day, an AM run of four miles and a PM run of nine miles and a hundred and say you're, you're running 90 to hundred miles that whole week, back to back weeks. It's easy to get stale. We don't, we don't have a ball involved. You know, we don't, you know, I don't have a lot of teammates that I trained with. So this is all on my own. So it, it takes runners are special. It takes special people to be runners. And I think it's all about getting motivated at the right time, knowing in the middle of summer, if I do this, I know I'll be around in October, at the end of October when I need to be, or November when that championship race comes around. Mm -hmm. And and that's around middle of October, the leaves start falling off the trees, the temperatures start getting cool, and that's my favorite time of year because I know – that cross country championship season's coming around, and it's and it's our time to shine because we did the work in the summer that is work, that that we did was what was required to be successful in the summer, so we can shine when the lights are brightest in the fall. Concord finishes third as a team that year, I believe, behind Wesleyan and Wheeling, 2014. We we talk about Howard Nippert, and, and before I ask you this question, just a quick uh, just a quick deal on Howard Nippert. Ran at Virginia Tech. He's from uh, upstate New York. He is a numerous time I like I don't know how many time, but a numerous time um, representative of Team USA in all sorts of ultra marathons, hundred Ks, 
50 Ks, you name it, Howard has probably represented the U.S. from basically everything from the marathon up. Um, so, so, so that's Howard's background. He also knows head coach Mike Cox from their time at Virginia Tech together. So that's that's the um, that's the connection there. So you you have that great cross country season. You go into track season, and and Howard always goes with the team to to be kind of the team chef for the week during spring break and uh, you know every year. Um, so. Steve, was there a time there, maybe during one of the track seasons, where you had a conversation with Howard where he kind of, you know, I don't want to say, you know, kind of lit a fire, but he, be, Howard, Howard has a way of just kind of giving you that extra nudge whenever you need it the most. Howard's a dirt baller. Some, something I, I tell my cross country kids this as a coach. He's a dirt baller. And they always want to know what's a dirt baller. It's somebody that loves what they do, absolutely loves what they do. And down at the beach that summer, or that not, sorry, that spring, I actually rolled my ankle. So on a track in high school, not high school, in college. And, and this is 2015, put, right? Uh, uh, 2016, because calendar year flipped. Okay. No, no, 20, sorry, you're right, 2015, okay. I graduated in 2015. Uh, around the track in college, sometimes they put this metal po- uh, this like metal bar rail. all the way around rail. The, a rail around the track. And actually, I finished the race, and I rolled my ankle on that. I had terrible ankles, and I, I rolled my ankle on that. And I was down and all that. And Howard pulled me aside, and he's like, and this is something that he, that he told me, and this sticks with me. It's not what you're capable of. It's what you're willing to do. I know more capable people, but less willing. So what are you willing to do to get your ankle back to 100% in this week so you can come out and run the 5K next Saturday at the beach, at Myrtle Beach? So we're down there at the hotel lobby, and he's like, well, you're going to get in the pool, and you're going you're gonna to run laps. Well, I guess I don't know what he called it, but walk laps around the pool stationary bike stuff like that what are, he's like what are you willing to do and this is like dirt, back to that dirt baller mentality what are you willing to do to get yourself ready so you can be 100 percent by next saturday or friday or whatever it was and uh gosh darn it by, by friday my ankle was good and uh, we, we just kept training we go down there to the beach and walk on the sand and stuff and his wife karen is from williamsport maryland which is 30 minutes from where I'm from. Okay. And she's she's best friends with Mike Spindler's wife, Maria. And and it's just they, Maria and Coach Spindler would always call down and say, you know, you better take care of Starlet for you know stuff like that. So I really felt comfortable from the second you know I met Howard and Coach Cox. And that's just when I think of Howard, I think of dirt baller mentality, two, straight up dirt baller. Two things about Howard: we could spend. Instead of talking hours. about your career, we could spend hours talking about Howard. Just, just let's talk about biscuits. So, and the, and uh, secondly, it, it's an incredibly, incredibly small world. The fact that the Spindlers and and uh, the other uh, Nipperts know each other from from, uh, from from growing up together, their their spouses there. Um, but Steve, this is where I think it's going to get fun. If we haven't had fun yet in this conversation, and trust me, we oh, have. It's but been great. But this is going to get special now. Going into the 2015 cross-country season, expectations maybe to the casual observer looking – from the outside looking in, may, you know, doesn't really see Concord as a contender. But yourself, simmer on nicely. You brought up Brandon Lee. All you guys are back. There's incoming talent Jason Weitzel, Michael Runke. But you, you still – you guys had to jump Wheeling and Wesleyan from not even 2014, but even years past, just because of what they had done um, in the conference for basically a decade since Concord won a conference championship in 2007. So am I right in saying that at the beginning of that year, there's this quiet confidence that Concord could do something extremely special that year? Well, uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit before that. Okay. Uh, back to me being back to not being stale in cross country. That summer, I I, I plowed miles. I mean, I'm telling you, I did everything. I followed 
Mike Spindler told me, you follow Michael Cox's plan to a tee. And he says, and you do it. He goes, and you'll be where you need to be. And I did. And I'd go down with Coach Spindler, and he'd help me. He'd bike with me while I ran. And I, let me tell you something. I, 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 I was working, and I, I killed it. And I don't make excuses. I'm not in the excuse-making business. Um, everybody's in the same playing field. Everybody's got the same situations. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. They're trying to be the best that there is in the sport, and they're trying to win. Uh-huh. And, um, uh, you know, Mike, Mikey would – Coach Cox would send down a message, you know. He's like, hey, uh, Camp Atari's coming up August 6th to the 13th or something like that. He goes, uh, I'll see you down here August 5th. Get packed up and we'll go. And uh, I, I didn't show up. Uh-huh. It's not my brightest moment. Um, I, I didn't tell him. I didn't communicate. And I still kill myself today. I think I didn't. I mean, I just I was burned out. And I remember you called me, and you said, "Where are you at? What are you doing? You're coming back, right?" And then I kind of hit a reality check. And Brandon Lee's one of my teammates is calling me. He's like, "I know where he's at. I know where he's at." But that wasn't the point. The point is, I, I wasn't I wasn't paying my you know, due diligence by telling Coach Cox or not not even showing up. I was still doing my work, what I was going to do for running, but I wasn't with the team when I was supposed to be with the team. So I got stale, and it took me a while to to jump out of that funk. But I got down to Concord, and I apologized to my teammates, you know, face-to-face as a group. And a couple weeks, about a week later, Coach Cox says the MEC preseason cross-country rankings come out. He goes, I'm going to print you out a copy and hand them to you. Well, I don't even know if he knows this, but I low-key, when he handed me that, uh, we were ranked fourth. I went into the Carter Center, and I shredded it. I ripped it up and threw it in the trash. Who is – Because, as I stated earlier, the standard is the standard. And the expectation from day one doesn't change just because it's day 50. We have a goal in mind to win, and I do not care – we do not care what they have to say because they don't know what we did this summer. We have just as much of an opportunity to win as they do. And there's always a chip on your shoulder when you're at Concord because we don't always have, you know, the scholarship opportunities and stuff that some of these other schools can bring out. So why not try to pull a so-called upset and try to knock them off the throne? And we always wanted to do that. And me and Howard, this dates back to the 20, back at Pipe Stem Conference meet, when Wesley and won, no, I, I greatly respect them, and I greatly respect that their coach. I love Coach Skiles, and I love their team. Um, but as a competitor, uh, we, we wanted to knock them off the throne, and me and Howard were angry. We were very, very angry, and we got tired of seeing the flag being waved on our stomping grounds. That was our house. So all summer, I used that as a chip on my shoulder, even through track. And when we got down there and we saw those preseason rankings, I was like, this, this isn't good. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not good. I don't want this. And I never even told my teammates, you know, I ripped them up till later on. Well, I think I do. I know I told Brandon. So I don't know if – I don't think anybody really thought we were contenders, so to speak. Um, I think they were more thinking on the terms that we were pretenders, possibly. So it always – I had to to the fire. All right. <laughs> Two things before we move along here. Who was, who was also ranked in front of you guys besides Wheeling and Wesleyan? Well, Wes, we may have been ranked third. Okay, maybe okay. Was, I mean, maybe I said fourth. Maybe we uh, okay. I, uh, maybe that was the girls' team was fourth. Okay. I can't. Okay. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Not a big deal. I, I was just curious who okay. else. But secondly, I, I remember the story about you not showing up for camp, and I wasn't. I was not going to mention it. It ran through my mind as I was preparing for this. I said, you know what? I'm not going to mention it. But I just. But the one thing I do remember, I think I made the pizza run for coach cox on the compliance night because you know you do compliance before you go to camp mm-hmm. the following day yep um and and so i walk and, and i walk in and i walk in and i don't even say anything and coach cox says dude do you know where starlipper is i said i don't know is he not here he says nope and no one can get a hold of him and i thought this is bad this is real bad and and i remember telling you you're going to throw away this season. You guys got a chance to do something really special here, and you're going to throw it away. I remember I asked you that. It wasn't my brightest moment, but there was a little more fuel to the fire that season 
And uh, I won't bring it up till you ask the question or get more into it. But there was a little more fuel to the fire that season. I wasn't proud of that moment, but there was right. a certain sports team that uh, that really catapulted me. I think. Well, there was uh, a. The, oh, there was a that. lot of people that was glad you showed up later on. I know that. <laughs> yeah, it, so. I, it was my brightest moment. I just think people like you and and Brandon Lee for for, for a little <laughs> understanding a little bit about where I came from but also holding me accountable because I always oh. like having somebody to hold me accountable oh, for my role. Okay. I'm not proud of that moment. All right, well, here we go. Let's let's really unpack this 2015 season now that we got a lot of a, a lot of other things out of the way. So I think there's a certain time whenever the 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 program basically flipped itself upside down and, and changed to to what it is right here as we record this on December the 9th of 2020, second meet of that 2015 season, Concord goes to the Mountain East Conference preview in Bridgeport, which was it was going to be the first year that the conference championship was at the Bridgeport Recreation Complex there um, in North Central West Virginia. Not a strong field per se, but you guys – go one through six and then your seventh runner was eighth and I say this because it felt like you were at the forefront of this culture shift that was was underway previously but I think came to uh to a peak there at that MEC preview you win that meet personally Justin Snyder has a big coming out party that really I think catapults him into what he ends up becoming a Concord how much did that meet kind of change the face for you guys, Steve? Because you guys don't lose again that entire cross-country season until you guys get to regionals, of course. I remember that meet like it was yesterday. It was on September 26th. Um, back to the question about how do you get hot at the right time in cross-country. When we go to a and each opportunity that you get to show up at a championship stadium, venue, arena, cross-country course, where you're going to run your championship or could possibly play your conference champion or whatever it is, you do it. And we showed up there, and you learn the hot moments on the course and the cold moments on the course. I like to call the hot moments the energy portions of the course. So you study these things in your head when you're running that race. You're like, well, this is mile two. This is flat as a pancake. I can make a move here. This is a hill. This hill is at mile four of a five-mile race. I'm not going to be able to – I'm probably not going to have the energy that I had mile one at mile four, so I'm going to have to dig deep here and find a way. That day, I could see – and I don't know if the video you can see, but I could see on a ladder. I could see our confidence down here to start because when they looked at that course, it was a hill. It, it, it was rough. And then at the end of that race, our confidence was up here. Guys and ladies, both confidence went from here to here after that day and like you said i know the competition we might not have had a whole lot of teams there but a win's a win and anytime you can build confidence and win and in the cross-country world that that's you you take it you take that opportunity as you get them because winning doesn't always happen i like this next question a lot and i think we're going to really build off of this as i mentioned justin snyder just has a huge huge uh coming out party basically for lack of a better term at that mec preview meet in 2015 another guy that begins to kind of take some some small steps and then obviously take some bigger steps at the end of his career was tyler Cossett. he ends up being a top seven guy for you and i want to use a quote that that i heard a couple of weeks ago from the iowa state running back Brees Hall, after they beat Texas, and you, and, and you probably heard this too, he says, we're a five-star culture here at Iowa State, we're, and we just beat a, 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 a program that has five-star athletes, meaning Texas. And that Concord team, Steve, in 2015, you guys didn't have a lot of guys that had these huge high school accolades. I mean, yeah, Jason Weitzel was like a three- or four-time state champion. I think maybe Michael Runke, who was in the top seven, was maybe like all state in, in one or two events as a senior. And maybe even Cimarron nicely had some high school accolades, you know, like some all region, all state type stuff. The rest of you guys were blue collar guys. 
and the reason I say five star culture because that's felt it felt like that's where Concord got to by the middle of that season. What what was the thing that really made that culture do a complete 180 from where where it had been the I guess the previous two years. It's that question. I, I, I'm glad you brought up that question because exactly what I'm doing as a coach right now. Uh, my kids know that I want to build a first class program that demonstrates blue collar work ethic um, when we go about our business. And that team in 2015, uh, I was the only senior. Um, I think we might have had another one, I, but he. I mean, I don't know. I think he was more of a track guy. Um, us being so young and like you said a a lot of them didn't have the accolades but there was one guy on that team and his name was jason weitzel and he had tons and everybody knew him around west virginia being a very very solid five-star athlete out of Pikeview. and i just think that uh you know michael runke had a good high school career as well um i'm probably missing a couple others i just think that when they seen that they got thrown you know, they were on our team, and people like Justin Snyder, who, who me and Brandon and, and, and such, we, we were we were trying to, you know, show him the works and teach him a little bit as we went. And I just think when you put all those together, and we put it all together on that day at, at the MEC conference meet, and, and when we performed like we did, we knew that we could compete with anybody on any given day, whatever, no matter the circumstance. And I just think it just takes one sometimes. And I, and I just think that, you know, a lot of those guys, they, they may not have had the accolades that, you know, that, that other teams had. But we had that one guy in Jason Weitzel. And we could see it at Hagenstone Classic. We could see it all the way back to the Myrtle Beach meet, uh, Coastal Carolina race, that if, if we could piece this all together, darn it, we got a chance. And I won't repeat what I told them at the MEC preview meet afterwards or right before that conference championship meet in October. Um, to, to really get the get the blood rolling a little bit more, um, I just think confidence level standpoint, they seen what we were capable of, and that's how that's how that kind of brought got brought about. Yeah, and I, I want to say this, and I think this is very important. You talk about yourself; you're the one that really got the ball rolling downhill. Then Brandon Lee being a senior the following year, then Justin and Tyler the next year, and then Jason. And, you know, now, um, you know, you're seeing guys like Isaac Prather and, and Cedric Drennan now as they begin to kind of mold their career here at Concord. But, but I, Steve, I, I really think you go back to that, that MEC preview meet and where Concord said, all right, enough's enough from what the past couple of years have been. We're putting our foot down and we're getting back towards the top of this conference. And like I said, it, it's just been a snowball effect. And, and you, you have to have good culture to get that snowball effect going. I know you said you don't want to say what you said to your teammates there on the day of the Mountain East Conference Championships. But how, how, did you, how did you get that team to believe that Concord could win a conference championship? Or maybe, you know, maybe it was something Coach Cox said. I don't know. Okay, well... This is it's a little bit of another crazy situation. Everybody that knows me knows, you know, I'm I'm a diehard Chicago Cubs fan. True, true full blood Chicago Cubs fan. Was for twenty three years on my twenty eight living. Uh, that was a year that a guy they hired a guy by the name of Joe Madden and he came in and kinda changed the culture and I don't miss a game, so I see everything that happens. He kind of changed the culture of an organization that hadn't been to the playoffs that in seven years and hadn't won a world championship up to that point in 107 years. And all summer I'm running and using them as motivation. Then we get into September and, you know, the postseason runs starting to come about for them. And a guy by the name of Miguel Montero gets on Twitter, which I love Twitter, and he goes, hashtag, we are good. And he was a veteran on that Cubs team and against with a bunch of the young pups. And those young guys, you could watch and see their confidence soaring. And the fans, too, because we're the lovable losers. So I started using that hashtag after meets. I'd put hashtag we are good. 
And then next thing I know, the kids, well, not the kids, the student athletes of my, my teammates are starting to use that hashtag. And I, I think that had a little bit to do with the confidence. And then one day I show up to practice and Vivian Ruiz, who's on the girls team and Brandon Lee hand me this bag. And it says Steven on it. I was like, what is this? And I open it up and it's a John Lester jersey and John Lester's my idol. I mean, he, he, I mean, I, I love John Lester. He's got a great story and he's, he was the leader of the Cubs and I'm just like, Whoa, I, I, I really, really need to do something big for these guys. And then I just think that it gets a little deep there and emotional for me that the, we are good slogan. I even bought a shirt that says we are good with a hashtag award after the race. <laughs> of a conference and then just the the MEC meet and the Hagen Stone Classic when we finished all four guys in like the top 20 five guys in like the top 20 or something I don't even remember what it was and I just think the snowball effect there I, it's hard to explain me and Brandon Lee still talk about it today and then just to see that years after that we went on a three-peat we went from nobody from going four, third or fourth wherever it was in the preseason rankings to, to, to just three-peating it. And it was so it was such an honor to be able to sit sit back being a student teacher and being off that team because I graduated and seeing them still win. And then go to Nationals in 2016 and just, just to see how Justin Snyder, uh, Jason Weitzel, uh, uh, Michael Runke, uh, Jacob Ashcraft, um, uh, Cimarron, uh, just to see how they grew. And Brandon Lee. It was, it was just incredible. And I, I just, I love them all to death and I'd do anything for him today, and I can't wait to talk to him when I can see him again. All right, let's. Uh, one last thing about Concord here, and then I do want to jump into some Summers County stuff. When you look okay. back on your time at Concord, Steve, what's what's the one thing you remember the most? Well, first and foremost, the community atmosphere, uh, that the small town vibes, whether it's Dreama at the cafeteria, Miss Dreama. Coach Cox, uh, Dr. Miller, Dr. Mateer, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Nolan, Steve Cox, all them. But secondly, uh, after the MEC winning that conference championship and finishing second and winning it as a team, uh, somebody took a picture of me and Coach Cox. And mm-hmm. we were I was laying there just done. I, was, I 100% gave everything I had. And he come over and put his head on me and, and took my hand. He's like, you know we won, right? And I didn't even know we had won. And for him to tell me that after I missed, I didn't come to camp. I ditched them like that. I, 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 I just made a stupid boneheaded mistake. And to see how my teammates still accepted me back and to come through there for him and, and finish second in the race and help lead them to, to a conference championship and for Coach Cox to still, you know, to be right there and do anything because I, I would do anything for that guy. It was just that that's the second that 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 in the community atmosphere and all the great people I met, whether it's Dream, Brian Novak, uh, you, uh, Mike, all those guys uh, and, and ladies. That's that's the two things that stand out the most for me uh, when, when I sit back five years later. Yeah, just a real quick point here. I don't have it in front of me, but I think Concord that year in the conference championship 2015 on their way to their first conference title in uh, eight years. I think they put six in the top 16 or 17 somewhere in there. I know you were second. Jason was third. Uh, Justin was fifth. And then, like, Runky was, like, 10th or 11th. And then Brandon Lee and Cimarron were there, like, 15th, 12th, 16th. 11th. Se- oh, okay. s- something of that nature. Um, but, but nonetheless, it, it's enough for Concord to get their first conference championship since 2007. So, Steve, I want to jump into some Summers County stuff here. You're a trailblazer there at Summers County. The Bobcats didn't have cross country, right, until you picked up the program, I guess it would have been the fall of 2019, right? Uh, yes. Uh, it took, I mean, I got down here in uh, the spring of 2019, and I became an assistant track coach. And I was like, do we have cross country here? And nobody even knew what that was. They still think it's track today. And um, it took a lot of persuading mm-hmm. to, to get them to buy into, look, I want a cross country team. If you want to have a good track team, you've got to have a cross country team 
because it's hard for somebody just to train from June all the way to March between competitions. And they're like, well, we'll see, you know, and all that. And then finally, we, we got one. I, a guy by the name of Chad Matter helped me get it. Um, I can't thank, you know, the, the old superintendent we used to have, Kim Rhodes. Um, she accepted the, the, the fact that we could have one. Uh, Stan Duncan, people that sit down here in the school systems. And we got one. And then it was a struggle of keeping – the small, the small community, a small school, one A, getting athletes to come out and keeping them motivated to want to do it. Um, and then now that we're through two years now, and I mean, I'm excited for the program and the future of it. Yeah, you guys have made some big strides here, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, two things before that: was there a period of time, Steve, whenever you had to get the administration? And really, this, I, I guess the students to kind of believe in the dream that you were trying to sell to them. Yes, um, and it's and honestly, I mean, all the way up until this season, uh, you know, it, it was still like that, very much like that. Um, they knew from the day I was there. Uh, my, my my statement to them is, I want to build you know a first class program that is you know demonstrates blue collar work ethic when we go about our business, and that you know. Another thing that, you know, I, I had a coach, Jeff Spielman, the one back at Hancock, used to tell me, he's like, if all you do is win, th- that's not good enough. You have an opportunity to be a positive influence in the community and society. And when he said that, Wes, that struck me like a lightning bolt. Mm-hmm. Because our are these like Concord and, and here in Hinton, our sports are based off community fundraisers for for Hinton. I mean, you got to get the community. I mean, to, 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 to make the programs run. So we have an opportunity here, you know, to, to be positive influences in our community and society. So we don't only just, just perform the duties that are in front of us and the challenges for competing and running, but we perform community service projects. Uh, we cleaned up the old Lincoln School down here, uh, got it back nice. We, we take christmas cards when we can to the older folks in the nursing homes we do things like that and that's another thing you know i was trying to get the the students to buy into and we get very very good support from that we get very very good uh, attendance for that and to continue to change the culture here it's going to be hard because there's always a lot of changeover but anything is possible and I, i truly believe in that all right let's uh Let's wind back around here and catch Coach Mike Spindler and talk a little bit about Coach Cox, their coaching philosophies, the way they do things, and what you've been able to implement. Now, now obviously, obviously you can't get high school kids to run 70 or 80 miles a week. That's 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 ludicrous to think that. That is ludicrous to think that. Not realistic. But what but what are some things that you've been able to implement that that you've learned from Coach Spindler and Coach Cox? Mike Spindler. I'm, I'm telling you, he's like Howard, dirt baller. He's hard nosed. And if you tick him off, he's going to tell you about it. And sometimes I get very, very emotional. And the kids know when I get upset, and they know they better start getting their heads on right. So when I think of what I learned from Mike Spindler, I take that hard-nosed mentality, and I take it to heart. And I was a small-town athlete, so I know small-town athletes can make it. And I don't take kindly to ones that come in there thinking that they can't. So I coach only high-aspiring athletes that are motivated. And the rest, I will coach them, but they need to tell me their goals ahead of time so I'm not as hard on them. Now, Coach Cox, what I learned from him, just having, and of course, Coach Spindler the same way, but having those kids' as backs. I, they know anytime they need me, I'm going to be there for them. Mm-hmm. Coach Cox used to give, he used to leave, I probably shouldn't say this on air, but he used to leave, I guess he probably still does, he used to leave his key in his ignition of his truck, and he'd tell us anytime you need it, go. That's what I bring from Coach Cox that father figure type thing you know he he's going to be there for you and it's tough not to, not not to compete for him 
as an athlete, because all the stuff he does for you, you want to return that favor to him. And when I came down here to coach, uh, when I took the job here at Hinton, my, one of my goals was I want to get an athlete or two or however many I can get up to that man to help give back because he gave so much to us right as, as people right now you're so, so it's it's down here it's it's not the easiest thing to do but we're, we're, to coach these kids but but we're i i accept every challenge that's in front of me and i will give everything i got and like i said i tend to focus on the challenges in front of me just today and only today and the rest of the stuff down the road will take care of itself because i've took care of the challenges every day leading up to that all right, Steve. Last thing here, and this has been uh, this has been great. We're uh, <laughs> we're over I'll an hour. Three more hours. <laughs> we're over an hour. Uh, but last thing here, and I, I think this kind of brings everything back, kind of ties it all together. Um, you mentioned small town athlete yourself. Not many kids on your team. Basically, you and one girl in, in high school. Not not a huge community college team either at Hagerstown, but this year in the fall, a small team from a small town in West Virginia, not Maryland, but West Virginia, you get a kid to the state meet, and Maddox, uh, I'm going to screw up his last name, so if you could say it for me. I get it wrong, too, so okay. I think it's Lathrome. Okay. I'm sorry, Maddox, I don't know it, buddy. Okay, anyway, anyway, um, but you get him to the state meet, obviously a, a huge deal the first athlete from summers county high school to go to the state cross country meet and now here coming up in, in the fall of 2021 i guess he's going to be running here at concord so how much of, of your experience do you kind of see in this young man just how he has basically grinded his way to to get where he's gotten to so far it's very similar. I also have a young lady that made the state meet at Sarah Turner. Right. And um, I'm working, you know, with her daily to, on, on this stuff too, and also other athletes on the team as well. Um, that That's a really, really good question. I, a lot of my stuff is based off what I learned from Coach Spindler and what I learned from Coach Cox, but a lot of it's my own flair. And I try to coach the kids to peak at the right times. The challenge and all that is keeping them motivated enough to get to that point. And it never helps when you have nobody, no teammates. I mean, he had team, he had one, but when I'm talking like other runners that may be better than you or maybe right behind you, ready to challenge you to take over that top spot on the team. Mm-hmm. That's all challenges that's thrown in there. But what I always tell these that that certain student Maddock, nobody cares. Nobody cares at Shady Spring High School. Nobody cares at Pikeview. They don't care what challenges that we face. They have their own. We have their own. It's a level playing field. And pandemic-related circumstances or not, we're not going to let that factor into how we walk into a stadium or an XC course or an arena and perform. So for him to even get to get to the point he's at is incredible because the first day I had him, he wasn't able to run a nine minute mile to see his increase doing it on his own relates a lot back to my story at Hancock. And I always feed him the information that, you know, my nat, the, 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 the meets I went to at nationals, the Canadian race that I Concord the conference championship win. I always date back to that because that shows that you know where I came from coming from 120 students sixth grade to 12th grade in that school to Summers County High School that has a little under 400 small town kids can make it and they can make it big if goes back to the Howard Nippert saying it's not what you're capable of it's what you're willing to do it, I know more capable people and I know doing well he's capable of doing a lot of things at Concord but what's Matt off the throne you know willing to do to keep that mindset and to get there and i I truly i truly love that howard brought that up so the challenges are always going to be there and i i'm just excited that in year two we were able to get somebody up to coach cox or wherever he may have ended up i'm just grateful he decided concord because i know he's going to be all right there um i'm just grateful for the opportunity i've been given and i'm happy that 
we're starting to see this pay off and, and see somebody go up the run for Concord. All right, Steve. I think we uh, I think we have covered a little bit. I don't know if we've covered all of them. We've at least covered enough for one hour and ten minutes worth of tape here, and then this has been. This has been about what I about what I want it to be. I mean, this uh, this met my expectation. A little confusing air on that one. A couple stories, but I think no, I got it all no, I, I I enjoy the stories. Anytime we can get some good stories going, that that is perfect. But uh, Steve, man, we we thank you so much for stopping by here today, episode number fourteen on this deal, and we look forward to you to you uh, having more success there. At, at, at Summers County and hopefully sending us more Bobcats to be mountain lions. Thank you, Wes. I appreciate the opportunity. Take care, buddy. Once again, Stephen Starlipper, episode number 14 of Concord University's Athletic Alumni at Work interview series.